You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. Lecture number two of the lecture cycle by Rudolf Steiner entitled Practical Advice to Teachers. This lecture two was given on August 22nd, 1919. Now we will develop more fully what we only outlined yesterday. You will see from what was said that even in the details of teaching there is much that needs to be transformed and renewed. Consider for a moment what I pointed out to you an hour ago. Footnote, see Lecture 2, The Foundations of Human Experience. End of footnote. If you think about what I presented, you will realize that human beings carry three inner focal points and within each affinity and aversion meet. We can say that aversion and affinity even meet in the head. We can simplify it schematically. Imagine that in a certain part of the head the nervous system is first interrupted while sensory perceptions enter, and they encounter aversion arising from the individual. This example demonstrates how we must view each individual system anew in the whole human being. Sensory activity itself is essentially a kind of delicate limbs activity. It occurs in such a way that affinity dominates the senses and the nervous system sends aversion to meet it. In the activity of seeing, a kind of affinity occurs in the eye's blood vessels. Aversion flows through that affinity in its nervous system. This is how seeing takes place. And more important to us, For the moment, a second meeting takes place between affinity and aversion in the central part of the human being. Affinity and aversion also meet there. Thus, in the middle system, the chest region, there is another meeting of affinity and aversion. Again, the whole human being is active as affinity and aversion meet with our awareness in the middle system. You also know that this meeting can be expressed in response to an impression a rapid reflex involving very little thought, since it is simply an evasive, instinctive act directed against a perceived threat. These subconscious reflexes are also mirrored in the brain and the soul, and so the whole, again, acquires a kind of pictorial nature. With images, we accompany what occurs in the chest, the respiratory and rhythmic system, in relation to the meeting between affinity and aversion. Something happens in the breast, that is intimately related to the whole life of a human being. There is a meeting between affinity and aversion that has an extraordinarily significant connection with our outer life. In our whole being we develop a certain activity that becomes affinity. We cause this affinity to interact continually in our chest organization with the cosmic activity of aversion. Human speech is the expression of these sympathetic and antipathetic activities that meet in this way. And the brain complements this meeting of affinity and aversion in the breast through our understanding of speech. We follow speech with understanding. Fundamentally in speech there is an activity in the breast and there is a parallel activity in the head. In the breast the activity is far more real, whereas the activity in the head fades to an image. In fact, when you speak, you have a constant breast activity that you accompany with an image through the head activity. This makes it obvious that speaking is based on the constant rhythm of sympathetic and antipathetic activity, just as feeling is. Indeed, speech originates in feeling. The way we accompany the feeling with the knowledge or image causes the content of speech to be identical with thoughts. We understand the speech phenomenon only when we truly understand how it is rooted in human feeling. Speech is, in fact, rooted in two ways in human feeling. First, it is based in everything a human being brings toward the world through the feeling life. What do we bring to the world in our feelings? Let us look at a distinct feeling or nuance of feeling, for example, astonishment or amazement. To the degree that we remain within the microcosm that is the human being with our souls, we have amazement. 
If, however, we can establish a cosmic connection, a cosmic relationship that can be connected to this feeling nuance of amazement, then amazement becomes the sound O. Oh. Footnote. The vowels in this context are the pure vowels of the German language. A, A as in father, E as in light, I as in me, O as in order, U as in blue. <coughs> End of footnote. The sound of O oh is really the breath working in us when caught inwardly by amazement. Thus, you can consider O oh an expression of amazement. In recent times, outer consideration of the world has related speech only to something external. The question was this, how did the relationship between sounds and what they mean first arise? No one realized that everything in the world leaves an impression on a person's feelings. In some situations it may be so vague that it remains half unconscious. But we will not find anything described by a word with the sound O oh that does not in some way engender, however slightly, astonishment. If you say open, the word contains an O oh sound, because something inherent in it causes slight astonishment. The roots of speech are contained in human feelings in this way. Feelings link you to the whole world, and you give the whole world sounds that in some way express these feeling connections. Typically, such things have been viewed superficially. There was the belief, for example, that speech imitates the way in which excuse me, let me read that again. There was the belief, for example, that speech imitates the way an animal barks or growls. Based on this belief, the well-known bow-wow theory of linguistics asserted that all speech is imitation. Such theories are dangerous, because they are partly true. By copying a dog and saying bow-wow, which carries the feeling nuance expressed in ow, one has entered a dog's soul condition. The sound is not formed according to theory, but in a less direct way, by placing oneself in the dog's condition of soul. Another theory maintains that every object contains an inherent sound, such as a bell, for example, has its own sound. The ding-dong theory, as it is called, arose from this assumption. These are, in fact, the theories, but we cannot understand the human being unless we acknowledge that speech expresses the world of feeling connections we form with objects around us. We also tend to have a nuance of feeling toward empty or black objects, that is related to emptiness. This feeling toward anything related to blackness is the feeling of fear or anxiety. This is expressed in the oo sound. The feeling nuance of wonder and admiration is expressed in the ah sound. This is a feeling toward what is full, everything white, bright, and related to whiteness and brightness, and the feeling toward the sound related to brightness. When we feel that we must ward off an external impression, or in some way turn away from it for self-protection, and if that feeling is one of resistance, it is expressed in the E sound. And its opposite feeling, that of aiming toward or approaching and uniting with something, is expressed in the I sound or E sound. Actually, E sound. It's the letter I, but the sound in German is E sound. These, then, are the main vowels. We will cover the details later, including the diphthongs. One other vowel should be considered which occurs less frequently in European languages and expresses something stronger than all the others. If you try to find a vowel by letting A, ah, O, oh, and U sound together, this expresses at first a feeling of fear and then an identification with what is feared. This sound expresses the most profound awe. It is found with particular frequency in Asian languages and shows that Asians are able to develop tremendous awe and veneration whereas in Western languages this sound is missing, <coughs> since awe and veneration are not the strongest traits of Europeans. We now have an image of the inner soul moods expressed by the vowels. All vowels express the inner soul stirring in our affinity with things. Even when we are afraid, the fear is based on a mysterious affinity. We would never fear something without having a hidden affinity for it. In examining such matters, however, you must remember that it is relatively easy to make the observation that O oh has something to do with astonishment, U with fear and anxiety, A ah with admiration and wonder, A, the letter E, with resistance, E with approaching something, and A-O-U with veneration, Au. 
I suppose that's owl. Nevertheless, one's ability to observe these connections will be obscured by confusing the feeling nuance that comes from hearing the sound and the feeling nuance that arises when speaking the sound. The two are different. You must bear in mind that the nuances of feeling I have enumerated are related to communicating the sounds. <clears throat> they apply when you want to communicate something to someone by using the sound. If you wish to tell someone that you are afraid, it is expressed by the oo sound. There is a difference of nuance when you yourself are afraid, and when you want to arouse fear in someone else by articulating oo, your own fear will be echoed back when you attempt to arouse it in another, for example by saying to a child, oo. It is important to consider this aspect with regard to the social implications of speech. If you do so, you will easily see the point. <clears throat> the feeling here is a pure inner soul process. This soul process, which is specifically based on the effect of affinity, can be met from outside by aversion, and this occurs through the consonants. When we join a consonant in a vowel, affinity and aversion mingle, and the tongue, lips, and palate make themselves felt as organs of aversion that ward things away. If we spoke only in vowels, we would continually surrender ourselves. We would, in fact, merge with things and be extremely selfless. We would unfold our deepest affinity for everything around us and would withdraw somewhat only because of nuances of affinity. For example, when we feel fear or horror. Even our withdrawal would contain an element of affinity. Vowels are related to our own sounding. Likewise, consonants are related to things which sound with consonants. Consequently, you find that we must view vowels as nuances of feeling, whereas we find that consonants F, B, M, and so on are imitations of external things. Hence, I was correct yesterday when I showed you how F is related to a fish, since I imitated the shape of the fish. It is always possible to trace consonants back to an imitation of external objects, whereas vowels are very elementary expressions of feeling nuances in people toward things. Therefore, we can view speech as a confrontation between aversion and affinity. Affinities are always present in vowels, and aversions are always present in consonants. <coughs> We can also view speaking in another way. What kind of affinity is expressed in the chest region of the human being so that as a result the chest arrests aversion and the head merely accompanies it? The basis of it is musical, something that has passed beyond certain boundaries. Music is the foundation and it goes beyond certain limits. In a sense it surpasses itself and becomes more than music. In other words, to the degree that speech contains vowels, it encompasses something musical. To the degree that it contains consonants, it carries a kind of sculpture or painting. Speech is a genuine synthesis, a true union in the human being of the musical with the sculptural element. Thus we can see that with a kind of unconscious subtlety, language reveals not only the nature of individuals, but that of human communities as well. In German, Kopf, head, expresses in every sense a roundness of form. Kopf denotes not only the human head, but also a head of cabbage, for example. In the word Kopf, the form is expressed. The Roman languages do not depict the form of the head. There, in Italian, we find the word Testa, which expresses something in the soul realm. Testa expresses the head as witness, something that testifies and identifies. This word for head comes from a very different foundation. On the one hand, it expresses a sympathetic feeling of the mind, while on the other, it depicts a fusion of aversion with the external world. For now, let us try to determine the difference in terms of the main vowels. In Kopf, the O relates to astonishment. The soul feels something like astonishment in relation to anything round, because roundness is itself related to all that evokes astonishment. In Testa, the E relates to resistance. If someone states something, we must in turn assert ourselves and resist, otherwise we would simply merge and mingle with that individual. This feeling nuance is well expressed where a national tendency to testify or witness 
is an aspect of the head. When you consider these matters, you are led away from the abstraction of looking to see what the dictionary says. This word for this language, that word for that language, the words in the different languages are in places taken from quite different connections. Merely to compare them is a purely external matter, and to translate by the dictionary is on the whole the worst kind of translating. The word Fuss in German, foot, is related to taking a step, making an empty space, a furche, furrow. The word for foot is related to the word for furrow. We take the foot and name it for what it does, make an impression. The word for feet in the Romance languages, Portuguese, pes, is taken from standing firm, having a standpoint. This linguistic study of meaning is extraordinarily helpful in teaching, but it does not yet exist as a science. We could ask why these things are as yet not included in science, even though they are. They offer real practical help. The reason is that we are still working out what is necessary for the fifth post-Atlantean age, especially in terms of education. Footnote. The fifth post-Atlantean, in quotes, period refers to our current cultural and historical era, the fifth since the so-called Atlantean period of Earth's evolution. See an outline of esoteric science, chapter 4, for a full overview of this subject. End of footnote. <clears throat> if you accept that speech in this sense indicates something inward in the vowels and something external in the consonants, you will find it very easy to create images for the consonants. You will no longer need the pictures I will give you in the next few lectures. You will be able to make your own and establish an inner connection with the children. This is much better than merely adopting an outer image. In this way we recognize speech as a relationship between the human being and the cosmos. On our own as human beings we would merely remain astonished, but our relationship with the cosmos invokes sounds from our astonishment. Human beings are embedded in the cosmos in a particular way, and we can observe this externally. I am saying this because, as you saw in yesterday's lecture, much depends on the nature of our feelings toward growing children, the degree of reverence we have toward the mysterious revelation of the cosmos in growing human beings. A tremendous amount depends on our ability to develop this feeling as teachers and educators. <clears throat> now let's take a broader view and look again at the significant fact that the human being takes about 18 breaths per minute. How many breaths is this in four minutes? 18 times 4 equals 72 breaths. What is the number of breaths in a day? 18 times 60 times 24 equals 25,920 per day. I could also calculate this in a different way by beginning with the number of breaths in four minutes, 72. Then instead of multiplying this number by 24 times 60, I would simply multiply it by 6 times 60 or 360. I would arrive at the number of 25,920 breaths per day, 360 times 72 equals 25,920. We can say that our breathing for four minutes, breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out, is in a sense a microcosmic day. The sum of 25,920 I obtained by multiplying it by 360 relates to this as the process of a whole year. The day of 24 hours is like a year for our breathing. Now we will look at our larger breathing process, which is made up of a daily alternation <clears throat> between being awake and sleeping. What basically is being awake and sleeping? It means that we breathe something out and breathe something in. We breathe out our eye-being and astral body when we go to sleep, and we breathe them in when we awake. This occurs during the course of 24 hours. To arrive at a sum for the course of a year, we must multiply the day by 360. So, with the greater breathing process, in one year we complete something similar to what we complete in one day with the microcosmic breathing process, assuming that we multiply what takes place in four minutes by 360. <clears throat> if we multiply what takes place with waking and sleeping during one day by 360, the answer shows us what takes place in one year. And if we multiply one year by an average lifespan, that is by 72, we arrive again at 25,900. Now we have discovered a twofold breathing process, our in and out breathing, 
which takes place 72 times in 4 minutes and 25,920 times in one day, and our waking and sleeping, which takes place 360 times in one year and 25,920 times during a lifetime. Furthermore, we find a third breathing process by following the sun's course. You know that the spot of the sunrise in spring appears to advance slightly every year. After 25,920 years, the sun has moved around the whole ecliptic. Once again, we have the number 25,920 in the planetary cosmic year. How is our life ingrained in the universe? Our average lifespan is 72 years. Multiply this by 360 and you arrive again at 25,920. You can imagine that in a platonic year, the cosmic revolution of the sun, our human lifespan is but a day. Thus we can regard what is depicted as a year in the universe as one breath in our human lifespan and see our human lifespan as a day in the great cosmic year. Accordingly, we can revere even the smallest process as an image of the greater cosmic process. If we look at the whole process more closely, we find in the platonic year, that is, in what happens during a platonic year, an image of the process of evolution from the old Saturn through the Sun, Moon and Earth stages and right up to the Vulcan stage. Footnote. These evolutionary stages have been given planetary names, though they do not relate directly to the physical planets as such. See an outline of esoteric science, chapter 4, quote, Cosmic Evolution and the Human Being, unquote. End of footnote. All the processes that take place, as indicated, are ordered like breathing processes related to 25,920. All that occurs in our life, between waking and sleeping, expresses the ancient moon period of evolution, the present earth evolution, and the future Jupiter evolution. This expresses all that makes us members of what exists beyond our earth. The same thing that makes us earthly human beings also takes place in our smallest breathing process. As human beings, our alternation between waking and sleeping expresses our relationship to the ancient evolutionary periods of moon, earth, and Jupiter and our lifespan expresses how, as cosmic human beings, we are rooted in the conditions of the universal year. For cosmic life and the whole planetary system, one day of our lives is a single breath, and all the seventy-two years of our life are a single day for the being whose organs are our planetary system. Overcome the illusion that you are a limited human being. Think of yourself as a cosmic process. That is the reality, and you will be able to say, I am a breath of the universe. If you understand this so that you can remain completely indifferent to the theoretical aspect, a process of interest only in passing, <clears throat> and if on the other hand you can maintain a feeling of immeasurable reverence for what is expressed so mysteriously in every human being, this sense will become the solid foundation within you that must be the foundation for teaching. In the future education cannot proceed merely by bringing conventional adult life into teaching. It is truly awful to consider the possibility that in the future elected parliaments will meet and decide questions of education based on the recommendations of those whose only reason for involvement is their sense of democracy. If things develop in this way as they are now doing in Russia, the earth would lose its task and have its mission withdrawn. It would be expelled from the cosmos and fall to Araman. Footnote Araman is the name given a spiritual being who wants to hold humanity in a hardened material state and no longer evolving. Lucifer is Araman's counterpart who tempts humankind to disembody spiritually, thus evolving too quickly and becoming overly emotional. Rudolf Steiner posited the Christ as mediator and balance to these two retarding forces. The end of footnote. It is time to derive what belongs to education from our knowledge of the relationship between humankind and the cosmos. We must imbue all our teaching with a feeling that standing before us is a growing human being, one who continues what took place in the supersensible world before conception and birth. This feeling must grow from the sort of recognition we arrived at as we considered the vowels and consonants. This feeling must permeate us completely. 
Only when we are truly permeated by this feeling can we teach properly. Do not believe that this feeling can be fruitless. The human being is organized so that if our feelings are oriented correctly, we will derive our guiding forces from them. If you cannot manage to see every human being as a cosmic mystery, you will not get beyond the sense that people are no more than mechanisms, and if such a feeling were cultivated it would lead to the downfall of earthly culture. On the other hand, earthly culture is raised only when we permeate education with a feeling that the whole human being has cosmic significance. <clears throat> and this cosmic feeling arises only when we regard the content of human feeling as belonging to the period between birth and death. Human thinking indicates the period before birth, and what exists in the human will points to what comes after death as a seed for the future. As the threefold human being stands before us, first we see what belongs to the time before birth, then we see what lies between birth and death, and third we see what awaits us after death. Our life before birth enters our existence as images, and the seed of what lies beyond death exists within us even before death. Only facts such as these will give you some idea of what actually happens through human interrelationships. When reading older works of education, <clears throat> the pedagogy of Herbart, for example, which was excellent in its day, we always have the feeling that those people were using concepts that could not help them reach the world. They remain outside reality. Footnote, Johann Friedrich Herbart, 1776-1841, to 1841, German philosopher and educator, he tutored in Switzerland where he became interested in Pestalozzi's pedagogical methods. He developed a general metaphysical theory of pluralistic realism, with implications especially for psychology, <clears throat> that rejected notions of faculties and innate ideas and constructed a theory on which to base a pedagogy similar to that of Pestalozzi. Major works include Allgemeine Pädagogik, 1806, Psychologie als Wissenschaft, Neue Gemeine Metaphysik, 1829, and a footnote. Just consider the way affinity permeates all willing when properly developed in the earthly sense, how the seed of the future that belongs to the time after death, yet exists in us as a result of the will, is permeated by love and affinity. Likewise, in education, we must watch everything in an especially loving way, so that it can be arrested or cultivated properly. We must assist children in their affinity by appealing to the will. What will the true impulse for an education of the will have to be? That impulse can only be the affinity we must develop toward the child. As that affinity develops toward our students, our educational methods will improve. Because educating the thinking is the opposite of educating the will, since it is permeated with aversion, you must ask whether we should develop aversions when we educate the thinking intellect of students. Yes, indeed, but you must understand it correctly. Place your aversions on the proper foundation. You must try to understand the students themselves if you want to properly educate their thinking capacity. Such understanding contains within it an element of aversion, since it belongs at this end of the scale. <clears throat> By comprehending your students and endeavoring to penetrate all their nuances, you become the teacher of their understanding, their faculty of knowledge. The aversions exist in this very activity, but you make the aversion good by educating your students. <clears throat> Furthermore, you can be certain that we are not led to meet one another in this life if there are no preconditions for such a meeting. These external processes are always the outer expression of something inner, regardless of how strange this may seem to a conventional worldview. The fact that you are present to teach these children from the Waldorf factory, and the fact that you will do what is necessary in this regard, indicates this group of teachers and this group of children belong together in terms of karma. You become the appropriate teacher for these children, because in previous times you developed aversions toward them. Now you free yourself from these aversions by educating their thinking. And we develop affinities in the right way by aiding the appropriate development of the will. Be very clear about this. 
you can best penetrate the twofold human being as discussed in our seminar. But you must try to understand every aspect of the human being. Through what we attempted in the seminars, you will become a good educator of only the children's thinking. Footnote. They discussed ways of dealing with children in terms of their temperaments. On the twofold human being and the four temperaments, see Discussion 1 in Discussions with Teachers. This discussion is also included in Rhythms of Learning, Robert Trostley, editor, as, quote, Understanding Children's Temperaments, unquote. Also, see Rudolf Steiner's Four Temperaments in Rhythms of Learning, and in Anthroposophy in Everyday Life. End of footnote. For the will life, you will be a good educator by trying to surround each individual with real affinity. These things belong to education. Aversion enables us to comprehend, and affinity enables us to love. Since our bodies have centers where affinity and aversion meet, this affects our social interaction as expressed in the process of teaching. I ask you to think this through and take it into your feelings so that we can continue tomorrow. The end of Lecture 2